Hello everyone, my name is Cecile McGuire. I'm the Senior Manager International at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Queensland. Thank you very much for joining us today uh, for this webinar to give you more information about studying medicine at the University of Queensland. We have a number of speakers who will uh, be addressing you today and I'm going to start with my colleague Professor Stuart Carney, the Medical Dean and the Deputy Executive Dean at the Faculty of Medicine. He'll do the first presentation. Over to you Stuart. Thank you very much, Cecile. I, can colleagues hear us? Great. So thank you very much, Cecile, and welcome. Uh, good evening, Canada, and uh, good morning to my colleagues here in Australia. As Cecile mentioned, I'm the medical dean and responsible for our medical program here at the University of Queensland. As is our custom, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet, and I'm speaking to you from Brisbane, so I would like to acknowledge the Yagara and Turrbal peoples. And in particular, I'd like to pay respect to First Nations peoples, uh, both here in Australia and in Canada, uh, and in particular acknowledge their ancestors and their descendants. In these unprecedented times, I think it's also important to recognize that First Nations peoples have uh, felt a disproportionate impact of coronavirus, of COVID-19. Uh, but I'd also like to acknowledge the huge amount of work that First Nations peoples are doing uh, to keep their communities safe uh, and contribute more broadly to the public health uh, challenges that we face. I'm going to share some slides with you. Um, so if you bear with me whilst I uh, open up the share slide function. There you go. So hopefully my slides are now uh, on, the, on the screen. So I have a dozen or so slides, so I'll speak for the first 15 minutes. So as I said, uh, I'm the, uh, the Dean of the medical program here at the University of Queensland. And the first slide shows a sort of a wonderful picture of our main medical school building. Main as in M-A-Y-N-E, building uh, was a gift from the main family here in Brisbane. As you'll see, sort of, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of a wonderful sort of classical facade. Now, I know that you are, um, you, have, you have choices. Uh, you are amongst the brightest people uh, in Canada and you can choose uh, which medical school you want to go to. And uh, I will look forward uh, with colleagues to telling you more about the University of Queensland medical program. But I just want to sort of to remark, and one of the things that struck me when uh, I was choosing where I wanted to work as medical dean, uh, that there are some great medical schools out there. Um, and the University of Toronto, I understand, has a great reputation. Uh, Harvard Medical School has a great reputation. Uh, my alma mater, uh, the University of Edinburgh uh, Medical School, is a great place too. But there's only one medical school in the world that, uh, um, that is bold enough to claim to be the medical school, uh, blazoned across uh, our classical columns uh, here in Brisbane. Uh, so, uh, um, so let me tell you more about the medical school, uh, and in particular, the University of Queensland's medical program. Now, the University of Queensland uh, is based, uh, as one might imagine, in Queensland, a large state uh, in the top right-hand corner uh, of Australia. Uh, it, is a, it is a vast state, much dissimilar to many of the provinces uh, um, with you in Canada. Uh, putting Queensland into perspective, it is nine times the size of the United Kingdom, my, my home country, uh, six times the size of Japan. The University of Queensland uh, is a comprehensive university, that is, it offers programs across the full range uh, of academic disciplines from the humanities uh, through to veterinary science. It's a top 50 global university, or at least the majority of league tables uh, um, claim that we're in the top 50. And of course, uh, like any uh, academic, I'm only going to, uh, to refer to the data which supports the point uh, that I want to make. And we are uh, clearly a top 50 uh, global university. Uh, six uh, faculties and eight uh, research institutes uh, and, uh, and teaching and research sites uh, across uh, both the state of Queensland, but also um, through our medical program with our partners in New Orleans. Now, the University of Queensland has been at the forefront uh, of the global sort of uh, um, activities to address the challenges of COVID-19. Uh, amongst uh, our team here at the University of Queensland, uh, we boast Paul Young, who is leading one of the 224 teams that is seeking to develop a vaccine uh, against COVID-19. They are, are building on the work they have done as part of the CEPI global uh, collaboration, uh, molecular clamp type technology uh, to ensure that we can develop uh, the appropriate sort of uh, vaccine 
uh, which hope which has now uh, entered the human trial phase, and we hope will be one of the sort of the three or four candidate vaccines uh, that can be disseminated worldwide. The University of Queensland uh, has a rich tradition in vaccine development. Uh, many of you will know that Ian Fraser, for example, uh, is, uh, is, is one of our sort of leading scientists at the University of Queensland, and Ian Fraser uh, was one of the leaders of the team that was responsible uh, for the HPV vaccine, Gardasil. But also sort of the University of Queensland working as part of sort of a global collaboration uh, is engaged in other activities which are sort of really pertinent uh, to our fight against COVID-19. Uh, issues from uh, working in collaboration with colleagues in Dalhousie in Canada uh, to, to better understand who um, is likely to respond favorably to ventilation uh, if they require intensive care, uh, sort of uh, an intervention, sort of ventilation within the, uh, the ICU facilities. Uh, from telehealth, which I think has been one of the great sort of developments as a consequence of, uh, of, of, of COVID-19. That, uh, that certainly here in Australia, we have brought forward uh, a 10-year plan uh, to ensure that individuals can continue to access healthcare through sort of uh, uh, digital uh, virtual means. Now, the medical program here at the University of Queensland is over 80 years old. It's ranked 37 in the world. Uh, and, uh, and as others will attest, you have access to sort of to top-notch uh, um, medical facilities here, um, here in Brisbane, uh, across the state, uh, and also through our partner uh, in New Orleans. But I think um, as we sort of reflect on some of the challenges that we face, um, not only as we grapple with pandemics such as COVID-19, uh, and historically having sort of grappled with uh, issues, epidemics such as Ebola, I think there are other challenges uh, that we need to face. Uh, and you as the future leaders within healthcare will need to grapple with over the next 30, 40, 50, who knows, 60 years of your professional careers. Uh, it is unclear when you will be able to hang up your stethoscope or whatever replaces that in years to come. But I think as sort of COVID-19 has highlighted it's highlighted significant inequities within our society and the disproportionate impact uh, that COVID-19 has on sort of vulnerable communities. But it has also highlighted uh, the particular impact uh, of our older adult population. Uh, and, and this is going to be a major challenge for healthcare going forward. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, we are living longer and we're living sort of uh, more fulfilling lives thanks to the broader sort of health and public health initiatives that we're seeing. But uh, with advancing age, uh, does come at increasing risk, increasing risk of frailty, increasing risk of conditions such as dementia. And in Australia, 459,000 individuals are living with dementia at the moment, and it, uh, that accounts for around one in 10 of the over 65 age group. But with an aging population, both here in Australia, but also in Canada, uh, there are particular challenges which our healthcare uh, system will need to adapt. And I think what this highlights, particularly as we grapple with issues surrounding sort of comorbidity uh, is that perhaps the pendulum will need to swing back away from a very specialist healthcare system. We will continue to need specialists and super specialists, but individuals who are perhaps better equipped to manage the complexity uh, of the conditions which people are presenting with, the comorbidities that people are presenting with, the evidence would suggest that if you have a single condition, seeing a specialist is likely to be associated with a better outcome. But if you have multiple conditions, a generalist, uh, is likely to support you to see better outcomes. And I think that is really sort of highlighting a shift here in Australia. And it's a similar conversation uh, that I'm familiar with in Canada, uh, that our healthcare system is needing to pivot uh, and, and ensure that we're better equipped uh, to deal with one, an aging population, and secondly, uh, a population living uh, with multiple chronic conditions. Australia, like Canada, over half of our population are living with at least one chronic condition, uh, and around a quarter of our population living with two or more chronic conditions. And this is presenting sort of real opportunities within healthcare as we seek to sort of adapt uh, and, uh, and, and flex so we can better respond to the challenges uh, which our populations uh, are, are living with. And I think uh, if I was going to predict uh, the next sort of 10, 20 years, this is always a dangerous uh, thing for any uh, body in my position. I think we're going to see uh, a greater emphasis on primary care, on the role of the general practitioner or family physician, increasing role of the general physician within our hospitals, uh, a sort of uh, an upskilling of the entire sort of medical workforce to ensure that we're better capable uh, of caring for people more holistically, uh, but also 
uh, a reaffirmation, a reinforcement of the importance of the team uh, that we know within healthcare that it is the team uh, that is associated with better outcomes for our patients. Now, as a socially accountable medical school, we're also committed to addressing some of the inequities that we see within healthcare. Uh, and these inequities, as I mentioned right at the start, are disproportionately felt by First Nations peoples, uh, by the elderly, by those with mental health problems, by those from lower socioeconomic groups. And, uh, uh, and, and given the tyranny of distance that we grapple with here in Australia and in Canada, uh, the importance uh, of addressing some of the challenges that our rural and remote communities feel in accessing healthcare uh, and, and as they manifest in poorer outcomes. So that is the backdrop. Uh, so we are a socially accountable medical school committed to improving the outcomes of the people of Queensland, the people of Australia, uh, and people around the world. Uh, and we benefit uh, from a rich and diverse community here at the University of Queensland. Around 40% of our students are international, uh, come from outside of uh, Australia, um, around 20% from the United States and 20% uh, from all over uh, the world, uh, including Canada. And that creates a rich uh, environment to learn and it creates a rich environment for Australia because we benefit uh, from you, our future leaders, asking the difficult questions, not accepting the status quo, pushing back the boundaries uh, and making us, and forcing us to rethink uh, how we do things. Because I think, uh, as I've already hinted at, more of the same is not the answer. We need to innovate, uh, we need to be agile, we need to be flexible to address some of the challenges that we are facing within healthcare, be they the next pandemic, but more importantly, uh, be they the consequences of chronic conditions and comorbidity. So it is against that backdrop uh, that we offer a graduate medical program, a four-year Doctor of Medicine program based here in Brisbane, but internationally connected. The medical program uh, uh, on paper is reasonably is, is relatively traditionally organized with phase one, which accounts for year one and year two, uh, and phase two, uh, which is the uh, predominantly invested in the clinical environment uh, in years three and four. But our program is an integrated program and we provide opportunities for students to be embedded and immersed in the clinical environment uh, from the early stage of the program. In year one, that's more in simulated clinical skills type environments. In year two, uh, that's clinical coaching experiences within our sort of great hospitals here in Brisbane. And in the years three and four uh, across our sort of broader clinical network. So let me tell you a bit more about phase one of the program. The first two years, I'm gonna go back the first, First two years of our program are sort of uh, organized uh, around sort of two semesters per year. Each of those semesters has four key elements. The clinical sciences, the biomedical sciences that sort of animate uh, what it is to be a doctor and contribute uh, to the added value that we bring to clinical consultations. Clinical practice, which provides opportunities for you to begin to hone and develop your clinical skills, ethics and professional practice, uh, which really sort of ground us in our social contract with society and the people we serve and health society and research. Because I think if we are gonna be well equipped uh, as the next generation of clinical leaders to not only care for the individual sitting in front of us, but also to ensure that we ask those challenging questions, we challenge the status quo and think about how can we make the system better, uh, then we need to be fully grounded in public health, uh, uh, research uh, and implementation science, so we can begin to sort of improve the quality uh, of the care that we provide. So serving not only the individual in front of us, but the broader public uh, and population. So clinical science, clinical practice, ethics and professional practice, health society and research uh, animate uh, the first two years of our program. Uh, they become increasingly integrated uh, by semester two, year two, uh, and, uh, and, and brought together through an integrated clinical studies uh, course and there's also an opportunity for you to undertake a selective uh, in year two uh, of the program as well. Many of, uh, of our students use that selective as a USMLE prep course uh, as well, for those of you who are considering possibly working in the United States. Now, by the time you move into phase two of the program, yes, you've had a grounding uh, in clinical practice by this stage and a thorough grounding in the public uh, health sciences, the social sciences and the biomedical sciences, uh, benefiting from our anatomy facilities, for example. You move then into the clinical uh, environment in a much more sort of comprehensive and immersive way. And the clerkships, the rotations uh, which we offer will be the typical clerkships that you would expect. We have clustered uh, these clinical placements uh, around semesters 
to provide opportunities for students to begin to see the linkages uh, between, for example, surgery and medicine, mental health and general practice, obstetrics uh, and pediatrics, uh, and the sort of the, the acute care, medical specialties, critical care uh, responsibilities that you will have as future doctors. Throughout all of this, you'll use a portfolio to keep track of your learning plan, your learning, uh, and provide evidence uh, that you are progressing uh, appropriately. Now, we are a research intensive university and we boast uh, giants uh, in research across the full sort of uh, gamut of research from lab based research through to population based research. And there are opportunities for you uh, as students here at the University of Queensland uh, to engage in research, be that uh, research projects, uh, be that um, summer projects, uh, be that an MD, MPhil, or, or an integrated MD, PhD uh, opportunity. We also, as a faculty, uh, have a School of Public Health, uh, and there's an opportunity for you to integrate and do the Master of Public Health program as well, as you seek to develop and hone uh, your research uh, skills, if that indeed uh, is what excites you and how you want to make a difference uh, to the future of healthcare. But I think whatever you decide, um, all medical graduates from the University of Queensland need to be research literate. And we hope that you are as curious from the day, from the day you leave as you were when you entered. But by the time you leave this uh, university, equipped with skills to be able to hone those questions, to be able to critically appraise uh, the literature, uh, and to be able to work with others uh, to apply that evidence in your clinical practice. Now, I'm a psychiatrist uh, by background, and, uh, and whilst yes, I can get excited about how we've organized our program and the sort of the teaching and learning aspects uh, of, of what we offer, I think it is important, uh, and I uh, reinforce and reaffirm this with my colleagues, that we do not lose sight of uh, the importance of the, of the connectedness of our community. We do recognize that the medical program is a stressful, it is a challenging time. The days will be long, uh, the exams will be challenging, uh, you will be working uh, very hard and you will be adjusting uh, to, to a new environment, to a new country. And therefore, uh, to support you, to, um, uh, to help sort of uh, um, you with the transition, <clears throat> we have a personal advisor network uh, which has been set up in year, um, from year one of the program, a member of faculty who will walk with you for all four years of the program. But I think Key to all of this is the UQ Medical Student Society, and I'll leave it to Matt and, and Hilary to talk more about some of the, uh, the broader support structures that are available that provide that sort of community, that network, uh, the individuals uh, you indeed will sort of, uh, uh, will call upon throughout your professional career, both to provide emotional, psychological support, but also sort of clinical advice uh, in your future clinical practice. And for those of you uh, who want to access additional support and need to access additional support, we also have a medical student support service, a quarantine service, uh, which, is, uh, which is there to ensure that uh, there's no impediment uh, to you accessing help and support, particularly if you're struggling uh, with uh, physical or mental health issues. Now, a little bit about um, uh, past graduates uh, who have joined this program from Canada. Uh, we have around 90 places set aside each year for onshore international students. Uh, and in the 2019 class, uh, the majority uh, of those students were indeed from Canada. There were 57 of them. Also, students uh, from Canada. All 57 of those students uh, were successful in securing uh, employment uh, on graduation from the University of Queensland. The majority of them uh, made a, an active choice uh, to continue to, uh, to work here in Australia, 50 of the 57. And that's for a number of reasons. I mean, I think they, some of them will have fallen in love uh, with Australia, others will have fallen in love with somebody in Australia. Uh, but I think uh, um, what my clinical colleagues here. Uh, in Queensland, uh, so keep on reminding me, is that there's significant alignment in the values, the attitudes, the sort of interests and capabilities between our Canadian students uh, and our Australian students, and that, uh, that those of you who want to work within the Australian healthcare system are welcomed with open arms uh, and, uh, and fit right in. Seven uh, of the graduating class um, matched to sort of residency programs back in Canada, uh, and are making a sort of contribution uh, to the Canadian healthcare system going forward. So I'd like to hand over to uh, Cecile uh, and, uh, and she will introduce our students. Thank you, Cecile. Thank you, Stuart. Professor Carney will be available to answer questions. We're gonna ask you to hold up questions till the end of the presentation. So I'd like to introduce a couple of our current students. We have Hilary Draper 
and Matthew Barker on um, the presentation as well. So I'm just going to bring up the presentation. Hillary is our the third year medical student with us currently on her mental health rotation and Matthew Barker is a second year medical student. So I'm going to ask Hillary to talk first and give you an overview of her experience and then we'll ask Matthew to, to speak to his experience. Over to you, Hillary. Hi guys. So um, as Cecile said, my name is Hillary and I'm a third year medical student, um, which means I am in my clinical years at UQ and um, I'm currently on my mental health rotation. Uh, so I applied to Australian schools at the end of my fourth year of undergrad um, and I was planning to actually take a year off after fourth year and work um, and maybe do, do some research, rewrite the MCAT, but I'd always thought it would be really cool to live in a different country um, and especially Australia given that they have such similar uh, culture and values to us in Canada. Um, so that last semester, I actually went to a seminar at Queen's University um, that was about studying medicine abroad. Um, and it had students who were in their residency at Queen's, but they had actually studied medicine overseas. Um, and two of those students were from UQ. So I ended up uh, talking to them for a while and they just made Australia and UQ sound absolutely amazing. Um, so I ended up checking out Austrek and applied um, just to see what would happen. Um, and I heard from UQ first and quite early, which was awesome. Uh, and I had to accept my offer before some of the other universities were even going to release their acceptances. So I thought about some of the things um, that Austrek and uh, the Queen's residents had said about UQ. Um, and I guess there were a few things that I really liked about it. So first of all, um, I think the biggest factor was that UQ, out of all the other uh, Australian universities, actually allows you to have the most away rotations back home, which is really important for applying back to Canada to do a residency um, because you do need references from Canadian doctors um, and you do have to have or you have to have had some clinical time back in Canada. So that was really important to me. And also because I'm a family girl and I wanted to be able to come back home and see my family every once in a while. <laughs> So that was a big factor for me as well. Um, I guess the other thing would be that, you know, UQ is, has a really great rep reputation. Like Stuart said, it's um, in the top 50 uh, in the world. So that was a big factor for me as well. It was above some of the Canadian schools. Um, and if you're in Brisbane or Australia and you talk to just you know, the average Joe and say, oh yeah, I go to UQ. They're like, oh my goodness, you must be really smart. So they definitely have a great reputation for education. Um, and some also the beaches are really great <laughs> in Queensland. So I have a few pictures here. Um, ones of me traveling with my friends last year during one of the breaks, one of my friends from Canada actually uh, came over for one of my breaks and we traveled up to northern Queensland and did a road trip all the way back down to Brisbane. It was beautiful. So those are the two pictures on the right. Um, and one of them is from Fraser Island, which is just outside of Harvey Bay, which is one of the UQ clinical schools, actually. Um, on the left, I have a picture of me and my CBL, who you'll become really close with at Mabel. So um, yeah, it's a great community uh, of friends, your CBL. So that's a great um, support network as well. And then on the left, on the bottom, um, is a picture of our UQMS sports day. So that's just a day where we kind of get together. We do a little bit of a pub crawl and then meet um, at one of the parks and just do some activities. And we are wearing our scrubs in that, yes. And I'll go to the next slide, actually, Cecile. And then, so this picture on the left is actually me and all of my Canadian friends. So we actually got together for Canadian Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving isn't 
necessarily a thing here in Australia. So we decided to do our own little Thanksgiving. And so it's really great because we have an awesome network of Canadians. Um, and you end up getting really close with them. Um, the middle picture is, again, me traveling with my friend last year. Um, that's in Lake, Mc Lake Mackenzie. And on the right is actually an orthopedics conference for women that I went to last year. Um, and I got to put on my first plaster cast. So that was pretty cool. So yeah, some awesome experience, experiences that you'll have uh, while at UQ. So I'll hand it back over to you, Cecile. Thank you, Hillary. And as I said, Hillary and Matt will also be available to answer questions. We'll just ask you to send those through on chat and we'll go to the questions at the end of the presentations. So Matt, I'll hand over to you. I'll just bring your slides up. Matt, can you share with the group a little bit about your experience as a second year medical student? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Cecile. Um, yeah, so my name is Matthew. Um, I'm originally from Edmonton in Alberta. Um, so currently in my second year on my break between semesters. Um, and yeah, so so far UQ has been a fantastic experience for me. Um, after finishing my undergrad degree, I Kind of like Hillary, I was taking some time off, um, figuring out what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go. Um, I had applied for uh, medical schools all over the world, actually. Um, and my research supervisor for my undergrad asked if I had heard of Austrek and had heard of applying to uh, the schools in Australia, which I actually hadn't at the time. Um, at hindsight, I'm obviously really, really, really glad I did. Um, I applied through Oztrek. Um, I heard back from a few a few schools and I was making my decisions. Um, and then I got my offer from UQ. And I had been doing some research into where I wanted to live and what I wanted to do while I was going to medical school. Um, and I felt that Brisbane was kind of what was most aligned with the kind of place I want to live and the kind of atmosphere I want to be in. And uh, I'm actually and I'm very, very glad that the opportunity came up. Um, so far I've found UQ to be phenomenal. Um, my first year was especially um, a great time. I got to do, um, I met a lot of great people on the top right. You can kind of see uh, that was my CBL for first year. And uh, we were quite tight knit. We did a lot of things together. We spent almost all day together. <laughs> um, on the bottom right, you can see um, in the scrubs from sports day, as Hillary was um, describing before, these are my some of my best friends from first year, and we still spend time together all the time. Um, I kind of adopted uh, AFL and the Brisbane Lions as my uh, favorite sports team in the absence of hockey. Um, so that's been a it's been a great experience. Um, and I can't wait to get back to games when the opportunity presents. Um, there's tons of great hikes in and around Brisbane and Queensland. Um, a lot of beach, a lot of beaches, as Hillary described. Uh, it's been quite phenomenal. Um, so I mean, the extra there's extracurricular stuff everywhere. Uh, there's lots to keep you busy and involved, which is great because it's sometimes it's necessary to just kind of check off from all the schoolwork and enjoy everything else around you and. Um, at the end of the day, Brisbane is a phenomenal place to be able to do that. Um, this is just so much to do. Um, in terms of the actual ex academic experience so far, it's been phenomenal. Um, UQ has such a wealth of great facility facilities, whether it's clinical facilities or um, facilities to study anatomy and the tutors and uh, instructors are phenomenal uh, and so friendly. Um, I can't, I can't count the number of occasions where I've been able to talk to an instructor for you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes after class, regardless of if I had a question that was important or not. Um, they're always very friendly and ready to strike up conversations. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been overwhelmingly positive experience so far, um, more than I expected. So I'll actually get you to go to the next slide, Cecile. And I think that's everything for me. Um, as I said, we'll pull questions to the end, and I'm sure Matt and Miller would be happy to answer any questions you have about studying medicine. 
Uh, you too. We also have Amanda Rollett from Austrek uh, with us on the panel today. Many of you will be familiar with Amanda, I'm sure. So I'll just uh, run through a few slides to give you some specifics about the emissions process, and then we'll take questions in any of our panelists will be happy to answer. So this is the breakdown of uh, our first year medical student cohort. So as Professor Carney mentioned, we take approximately 100 uh, what we call onshore international students. So those are international students from everywhere in the world who spend all four years with us here at UQ. We additionally take 280 Australian students. Um, so they're considered domestic students. Some of them come through a provisional entry, which means they come to UQ directly from year 12 do an undergraduate degree, and then um, matriculate into the medical program. We also have a partnership in the U.S. with Oshner Health in New Orleans. We take approximately 90 uh, students who are either U.S. citizens or permanent residents into that intake, and they spend the first two years with us here at UQ in Brisbane, and the last two years at, at Oshner, the Oshner Clinical School in New Orleans. Our entry criteria is pretty straightforward. If we look at um, your cumulative GPA on your most recently completed degree, UQ has a seventh scale for grading where four is the pass. So we need your cumulative GPA to be the equivalent of a five on that scale. We also require a minimum MCAT score of 504. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the MCAT um, in a couple of slides. So if you meet those minimum entry requirements, we assess your application and invite you to attend a multiple mini interview. And those are offered virtually um, for, for obviously international applicants who are unable to, to attend them in person. Um, after you successfully attend the MMI interview, we then assess your application with your MCAT score and your GPA worth 50% and your MMI score is worth 50%. This just gives you a breakdown of the timelines of when we will offer MMIs this year and then followed by offer rounds. So our first application deadline has passed. We are um, organizing to offer the first round of MMIs for our international onshore students in July. And the first offer um, round will be in early August. And then as you can see, we will run MMIs again in September, October, and November. So if you um, haven't submitted an application yet, um, you know, there still is time to submit an application and have your application assessed for the, for the future MMI rounds. A lot of students are um, thinking as well about the 2022 intake and our entry requirements around GPA and MCAT score um, won't, won't be different, but we will be introducing subject prerequisites. So applicants who are looking at the 2022 intake will need to have completed the equivalent uh, of courses that match our integrative cell and tissue biology and system physiology. And so we have information on our website about um, the specifics of the VQ courses, and we're also developing a credit database so that you'll be able to compare courses that you may have done at another institution to assess whether they perhaps would be equivalent, and then that would be assessed as part of the application for the 2022 intake. We're aware, obviously, that with the uh, COVID-19 uh, travel restrictions, particularly in, in North America, that many of the testing centers uh, that usually offer the MCAT tests were closed um, in, in April and May. And so what we did was we sought approval from uh, the university that we are able to assess applicants who have not yet sat and had and thus don't have the score, um, that they're able to be assessed and invited to attend the MMI before their NCAT test or the score is received. Um, we won't actually get an unconditional offer without an NCAT score, so we would invite you to attend the MMI uh, based on your GPA. We would then issue conditional offers to applicants who, who successfully attended the MMI. But the condition would be that you would need to sit the MCAT, achieve a minimum score of 504, and we would then issue you with an unconditional offer to study medicine at UQ in 2021. That's the basic, basic overview of our, um, our program and our admissions. 
I'm going to stop uh, sharing the screen and we'll go to questions. As I said, please, we, we have panelists that can answer any kind of question that you have. Um, first question is asking about rotations back in Canada. The students that have wanted to match back to a residency program, were they successful? Um, Professor Carney had shared the stats of our 2019 um, graduates that we did have some uh, uh, graduates who were successful in matching to a residency program. And that would be similar to you know, previous graduating years that um, students are able to apply and match back to, to residency. But we have seen a trend that more of our Canadian graduates are staying in Australia at least for you know, the first couple of years after graduation. But Hilary, you talked about doing rotations back in Canada. Did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so um, I would have had two rotations in Canada this year if COVID-19 didn't happen. But um, I guess her first question was, how hard is it to get rotations back in Canada? So you do have to do a little bit of your own work. Um, you have to, you know, reach out. to If you have any connections, you do have to reach out to them. You kind of have to work your connections as much as you can. So in first year, I did my obser observership back in Canada um, at an OBGYN practice in my hometown which was pretty awesome but then when I was trying to find rotations back home in Canada in third year I had emailed my um, supervisor from my observership to ask if he knew any GPs or rural doctors that would take me on so you do have to um, kind of do a little bit of work around that and then also you have to apply to there's this thing called the AF AFMC portal um, which it's kind of variable as to whether you get those rotations or not through the portal um, but it's better to go through the portal because they're more recognized um, when you apply for a residency um, and I would second that about that a lot of Canadian students are deciding to stay in Australia now um, I think seven students matched last year but there were only a few students that actually applied for a residency program as far as I'm aware so um, that was one of the reasons that I actually cho chose UQ again anyways was that they shared their match rate statistics and it was fairly good. Thank you, Hillary. Matt, we have a question about the size of our, our uh, class size and whether um, you have found this impact in your education and clinical environments. And both you and Hillary have shared some photos of your CBL group. I wonder if you could just talk maybe about how, how you found the, the class sizes and how all that contributed to your experience? Yeah, um, absolutely. So at first when I came to UQ and I saw this, I saw how big our class sizes were, um, I had those concerns myself. Um, but that being said, I have found that it hasn't been, it really hasn't been a hindrance at all. Um, lectures are very open to you asking questions either during the, during the lecture or after the lecture. Um, and you know, with law of averages, when you have any any group of students in a room and you have a question, chances are there's someone else thinking it. And that doesn't change when you have 100 students versus, you know, almost 400 students. Um, in terms of the actual group work that we do, um, UQ does a great job at splitting us down into smaller groups for whether it's our practicals or our clinical group. Um, so as Cecile mentioned before, and as Hillary mentioned as well, um, you spend time, a lot of time with your CBL, uh, which is your group of 10 people. Um, so all of your clinical practice activities, your clinical coaching, um, and your group work is with those 10 people. And you have a designated tutor for uh, the 10 of you um, for the entire semester. Um, so it really hasn't been a hindrance, uh, long story short for many, many reasons. It hasn't, it hasn't been something that um, I feel has actually impacted me in any way. Very good, thank you, Matt. Professor Carney, can I address, uh, send an assessment question your way? We have a student asking, how often are students evaluated during phase one? Is it through weekly tests, an exam after each block, or one cumulative exam? So I think Matt's probably a um, better place to, uh, to, to describe the lived experience of this. Uh, but the sort of uh, um, the formal assessments typically in phase one sort of uh, or, or examinations include a mid-semester exam and an end of semester uh, exam. But individual courses um, uh, may indeed have uh, have tests and quizzes uh, along the way. I mean, by way, just 
adding a bit more sort of context to this, um, I mean, there are various ways in which we sort of assess or provide a profile uh, on our students. And it's not just uh, around the academic capabilities of our students. There's also an expectation that our students actively participate in CBLs, for example, uh, that they're not just present, but they're actively engaged, that they're respectful and constructive in their challenge to each other uh, to ensure that the team uh, uh, works best. But uh, may I phone a friend, please, Cecile, and, uh, and ask Matt if he can provide a, uh, a, a more sort of proximal uh, response. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, so yeah, it, it, it really depends on the course. Um, the, 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 you take four courses and they're weighted in different ways, um, kind of based around the actual um, distribution of the time you spend in each of them. Um, so your clinical science, which involves all of your, um, all the ologies, I guess I'll say, um, is what you spend the predominant amount of your time studying. So for that one, you'll have a mid-semester examination um, that covers usually three or four modules. Um, your modules in the semester will be somewhere between two and two and four, two and five weeks long. Um, so for whether it's uh, cardiology, renal, uh, respiratory medicine, um, and it, it'll usually be a few of those things on the mid-semester exam. And then the final exam is predominantly non-cumulative. It's weighted, ours this semester was weighted um, at about 80% new material and 20% previous material. Um, and then there's also the third exam for clinical science is a anatomy um, pathology spotter exam, um, whether it's in person uh, where they have actual specimens where you have to identify something. Um, or as ours was this semester, um, image-based, where they gave you an image and a little vignette and you had to identify what the pathology was. Um, so that makes up the, the rest of your grade for, the, for that course. Um, the other courses, um, in terms of the uh, Health Society and Research and Ethics, um, Ethics is two exams, uh, mid-semester and semester. Um, Health Society and Research is varies it's mostly assignment based um, and not predominantly um, examination based. Uh, clinical practice is all attendance, performance, um, mini examinations. Um, so really the, the, the assessment as a whole in the program varies a lot. Um, so you kind of have a mix of exams and uh, performance competency, I guess. Thank you for that comprehensive response. Amanda, um, I'd like to throw a GPA question to you. A student is asking, what is a competitive GPA requirement for Canadian schools which work with a 4.0 GPA? Sure, I'm happy to answer. So we work with nine graduate entry options at Oztrec. Each GPA is a little bit different. Some universities will have a different minimum than others, and some will have a different competitive GPA. Each university does their individual assessments a little bit differently as well. So if we think about UQ, it's changed a little bit this year because of COVID, like Cecile said, and the MCAT um, not being necessary to apply. So minimum for UQ on the five out of seven scale, that's roughly about a 73, 74% um, or about a 2.7, 2.8 here in Canada. Um, but if you want to discuss that in more detail or you want to chat about other programs or about UQ in more detail, definitely reach out and we can discuss your transcripts and GPA. Thanks, Thanks Amanda. We have another admissions question that students asking whether how we look at students with graduate degrees. And so um, the FD um, program rules state that we look at your most recently completed degree. So if you are applying um, and you've completed a bachelor's degree, you may be enrolled in a, in a master's degree. It's not necessary that you complete the master's degree in order to apply for the MD program. We are able to assess you on the under, undergraduate degree. Students may wish to wait until they finish the master's program and, and apply with that, but we, we, we will look at the cumulative GPA from your most recently completed degree. Amanda, I might have to throw another question to you. The student's asking about scholarships. What scholarships are available for international students studying medicine at UQ? Mm -hmm. So 
The university website is probably your best bet to search for them. Um, I, I'm, it's something that's kind of done by students, so it's not, I don't have any that are on the top of my mind that I can recommend, but I think that it's definitely important for internationals to seek those out themselves, check the university website, um, and see if you are eligible for any. Um, I think on that note too, I should say that it's not, a scholarship is not something to um, base your, uh, your main source of funding from. Uh, in Canada, you'll want to look into your bank loans, your provincial student loans, and also have um, significant savings and family support throughout your studies. Thank you. We have a very specific question, Professor Carney, asking about the benefits of specializing in tropical or internal medicine at UQ. Thank you very much, Cecile. Um, I'll answer that question and also answer the CALMS match question as, as, as well. So, the Australian healthcare system does not typically expect its medical students and medical graduates to specialize as early as Canadian or US uh, medical students and medical graduates. So, uh, so I, um, uh, I, I, I see the sort of uh, um, the very focused drive uh, um, uh, behind that sort of question, which is perhaps more typical uh, of the, uh, the Canadian uh, system. So in Australia, you would graduate from medical school typically, and then undertake a generic internship. You would only begin to sort of, I suppose, specialize in PGY2, PGY3, and would typically enter uh, the sort of the equivalent of residency sometime around PGY3, PGY4, PGY5. So in answer to your question, there are great physicians uh, here at the, at the University of Queensland, and we have uh, colleagues who have expertise in tropical medicine. However, if tropical medicine is really an area you're really excited about, uh, then, um, uh, then JCU uh, has particular expertise uh, in tropical medicine, which is uh, an undergraduate program um, uh, offered out of Townsville, sort of uh, around a thousand kilometers north of us. University of Queensland, great place uh, for physicianly sort of training, great place uh, sort of more broadly. Um, but in the Australian system, you would not be specializing or committing uh, to a physicianly track uh, until sort of uh, until your internship PGY1, PGY2, PGY3. However, there are opportunities whilst you're here at the University of Queensland through the observership, which Hilary mentioned, and also through the um, uh, through your elective uh, to really test career hypotheses and to begin to build a sort of a, a, a profile about what you want to do. And, uh, and if medicine is what excites and enthuses you, there are also research opportunities to begin to sort of to build that portfolio uh, and, uh, and test your career hypotheses. So, um, uh, so yes, uh, um, there are a lot of great physicians amongst the alumni uh, of the University of Queensland. With respect to the CALMS match, now the figures vary per year, but by year, but in the uh, uh, it, as of this year, the 2020 sort of application round for those individuals starting uh, around now uh, um, for their sort of residency training in Canada. There were 16 applicants uh, amongst our sort of students and graduates. 13 of those applicants actually completed the application. 16 started, but only 13 got as far as, as actually sort of uh, completing all the components of that. 10 of those 13 were matched um, and, uh, and, and three were unsuccessful. Uh, of those who matched, um, every uh, 2019 graduate who submitted an application was successful. This varies from year to year. Uh, the sort of uh, the individuals who were less uh, successful uh, were amongst the sort of individuals who've been out uh, for a period of time, a significant period of time. In general terms, and Amanda, I may be able to speak more about this, graduates of Australian medical programs perform better than other countries or other regions uh, when it comes to the CALMS match. Uh, and the figures do vary uh, from year to year. But as I say, uh, that sort of, um, uh, that amongst the 2019 graduating cohort, uh, everyone who completed their application was successful in matching. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and of the six individuals who didn't graduate uh, in 2019, uh, three of those six um, uh, were successful uh, in, this, uh, in this round. And our students have sort of uh, have matched 
uh, across Canada from sort of um, internal medicine at McMaster uh, through to family medicine at the University of, uh, of Alberta um, and uh, Obs and Gainey uh, at the University of Toronto. So uh, uh, across a range of different specialties, anesthesiology, internal medicine, family medicine, uh, Obs and Gainey. Uh, but, uh, but interestingly, with respect to uh, um, the applicant uh, who mentioned internal medicine, uh, the majority of those individuals who did match, uh, matched in internal medicine. That seemed to be the most popular choice amongst the graduating class of 2019. Thank you, Cecile. Very good. Thank you, Professor Carney. Hilary, I know you're not able to stay till the very end of the presentation. So before you go, can I just ask you, we have a question about does the CBL group consist of Canadians only or Aussies too? So I might ask just to give a, an overview of your CBL group. Yeah, so it'll consist of a range of people. So I think actually one of the things that's great that they do at UQ is they try to make the CBLs diverse. So there'll be a few international students, a few UQ Oshner students, and then a few um, domestic students. So Australians as well. Something that's actually great about having Oshners in your CBL, or so these are people who are planning on going to the US and they do their last two years in the US, um, is that um, if you're planning on applying or matching um, back in North America, you may wanna keep your options open. So you may wanna write the USMLE, which is one of the selectives that you can do at the end of second year as well. Um, it's a USMLE prep course, which I also did. So, but having the UQ Oshners um, in your CBL kind of motivates you to study for that exam. So it's kind of keeping your options open for going back to North America if you're willing to do a residency in the States. Thank you, Hillary, and I appreciate your time. So please, when you need to leave for um, your rotation, let us know. Thank you very much. We have a couple of questions asking about if you uh, become a permanent resident while you're in the program. And I'll just clarify that if you are successful in achieving permanent residency status in Australia, but you've entered as an international student at UQ, you do not automatically um, get moved into a, what we call a CSP or a Commonwealth supported place. Your status would change to a, a domestic fully paying student. So if you have any more questions about that, we can answer some specifics afterwards. Amanda, I'd like to throw a question to you about budget. Students asking how much do you have to budget, you know, monthly budget for housing, food, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. So on, on, I just need to make sure I'm not on mute here. <laughs> on top of uh, tuition, obviously you've got to think about accommodation, flights to and from Canada or elsewhere in the world groceries, all sorts of things that um, make up your living in Australia. So Austrac normally recommends around 25 to 30,000 on top of tuition. Um, there are some great comparis price comparison calculators online that I always recommend. You can check out, you know, Toronto versus Sydney or Vancouver versus Brisbane, that sort of thing. But um, yeah, you'll want to definitely start thinking about your budget well ahead of time um, to make sure that you're financially capable of studying. Thank you. I'm conscious of time as well and if we're not able to work through all of the questions on the presentation today we will review them and make sure we update the FAQs on our website. But Professor Carney I wonder if I can ask you to, to talk about uh, the university in Australia's response to COVID-19. We have a students asking how likely it, it is that classes will be in person in January. Thank you very much, Cecile. So Australia has been um, both skillful and lucky, I think, with respect to its COVID-19 response. Um, I've, uh, Australia was able to introduce a, a series of public health measures at an early stage in the pandemic, including restricting uh, the sort of um, uh, flights into Australia, but uh, a, a range of sort of broader measures which have essentially meant that one, the, uh, the death rate uh, as a sort of pretty horrendous sort of measure of, of the impact of COVID-19 within Australia is just over a hundred. That's a hundred lives uh, lost to COVID-19 and each one of those um, sort of uh, um, people have family and other people who have, uh, have lost a loved one. But I think that provides a sort of a signal just sort of how successful Australia has been uh, in flattening the curve. 
there have been sporadic outbreaks uh, in, in and around Melbourne, in particular sort of recently, uh, and they're all being sort of uh, addressed. And that is anticipated that sort of it's very difficult to eradicate a, a virus such as COVID-19. Australia is now sort of cautiously uh, engaging in a sort of a reopening sort of uh, sort of plan. The consequences of that are uh, that increasingly sort of domestic travel is reopening and, uh, and, and, and public spaces uh, are reopening. The University of Queensland is welcoming back students to its campuses with appropriate sort of COVID um, uh, sort of precautions in place. So from a medical program point of view, we are committed uh, to offering sort of uh, wherever possible in-person learning opportunities for all years of our medical program, year one uh, through year four. Um, assuming uh, that these measures continue and that we're uh, operating in an environment where sort of community transmission uh, is, uh, is, is, is largely sort of uh, eliminated or, or very small, we anticipate uh, that classes will continue to be uh, in person next year. So I think the key message is Australia uh, has been successful so far in managing sort of COVID-19. Um, and, uh, and as a consequence, we're in a stronger position to be able to facilitate and enable in-person uh, sort of learning. We've also backed up with a significant portfolio of, of online learning. The last bit of the jigsaw, Cecile, is, uh, is, is, is international students coming back to Australia. One of the prices that we've had to pay for all of this uh, is that sort of people can only come into Australia uh, if they commit uh, to self-quarantine. So. Uh, Australian citizens and Australian permanent residents returning have to self-quarantine uh, and the government is committed to finding a way of enabling international students to, to return or to come to here in Australia recognizing how important you are to sort of our, our way of life um, but the cost of that uh, will be uh, that uh, the international students uh, will need uh, to self-quarantine please and we're working hard with the state and federal government uh, to find a way which, uh, which, which manages that in a supportive a way as we possibly can. Thanks, Cecile. Very good. Thank you, Professor Carney. I do apologize. We are not going to be able to work through all of the questions that you've submitted today, but I think we will plan some future webinars based around the suite of some of the questions we have, particularly around the internship in Australia, matching in Canada, matching in the US as well. So we'll get some of our graduates who have matched in both those places to, to come and speak to you as well. I just want to ask Amanda to make any final comments. We work very closely with Austrek in Canada. We have for a number of years. They're a great partner for us and a great, we offer such a great service to, to students. So Amanda, would you like to, to finish by um, letting the students know, you know what, what, how they can get in touch with you for any further questions? Yes, definitely. So on the, um, the note of all of the medical licensing questions, we actually have a medical licensing webinar that we'll be hosting on July 8th. So a couple Wednesdays from now. Um, if you would like to register for that, definitely get in touch with me, give us a call or send me an email. Um, I recognize a lot of the names in the chat, but my email is amanda at oztrek.com. Um, and I can send you the registration link for that. We'll discuss how to stay in Australia, how to come back to Canada, and how to go to, um, or how to follow the U.S. pathway in a lot of detail, and we'll discuss statistics and things like that, too. So definitely one not to miss. Um, so yeah, I think we, we are happy to help with any questions. Um, I see a lot in the, in the group that I'm happy to answer by email or if you want to give me a call, so please reach out. Um, if you haven't submitted an application, it's really easy. You can do so on our website. That doesn't submit anything to the universities, just gives you an Austrack profile and we can get the process started um, and yeah, get the ball rolling. So yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to hear from, from a lot of you. Thank Thanks, you very Cecile. much. Thank you very much, Amanda. And thank you to our, our students that joined us today. Hillary, as I said, had to leave to go to her rotation. Matthew, thank you for sharing your time with our, our students today. And Professor Carney has also had to depart for another meeting. So we appreciate your interest. Please feel free, feel free to reach out both to Austrek and directly to us here at the University of Queensland. And we look forward to seeing you on, at future webinars and hopefully in Australia in January. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.